Good morning, everyone. Today, this is our lecture about traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injuries. Now, um, um, wh why I'm making these lectures is basically um, what we have done in stroke. You know, all the rehabilitation techniques will be same. Either it's traumatic brain injury or it's spinal cord injuries. But uh, uh, so that's why, like, I will just give you introduction about traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injuries, what they are. And uh, the rest of the rehabilitation techniques are the same, which are already discussed in stroke. After this, like, uh, there will be very short lecture about cancer rehabilitation, a very short lecture about cardiac rehabilitation, or and a very short lecture, you can say, we can talk about other conditions, bone disease, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Okay, so what is the importance of traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injuries is... Uh, can be judged by ju just this thing that trauma is the leading cause of death um, especially in you can say younger age group and uh, uh, most of the deaths are due to head trauma and head trauma which leads to traumatic pain, brain injury is the most common injury to the central nervous system um, like uh, the, just in US, they have uh, what you can say they have run a study that um, majority of the patients, you know, uh, who are admitted or who died, who die each year, uh, basically they try like whenever there is trauma, they die due to traumatic brain injuries. So first of all, we'll talk about traumatic brain injury, and then we'll talk about the spinal cord injury. So traumatic brain injury. Okay, so as I told you that uh, one of the leading causes of the death, trauma. Trauma simply is a, uh, what you can say is one of the uh, leading cause of death. So um, due to trauma, uh, which can be of any kind, which can be again like road traffic accidents, which could be um, falls, which could be sports injuries, which could be violence like uh, fights and all those things. You know, of course, like uh, whenever there is head injury, um, it can lead damage to the brain okay so um, now uh, the things which we are going to discuss um, yeah, in this one um, uh, like uh, there are around 500,000 um, per year uh, traumatic brain injuries um, <clears throat> just in US okay in United States so like of course like the book I'm using so they, they give the data of uh, uh, United States so that's why I'm talking about that okay so now um, and out of these of course like depending on the severity many people they die uh, especially like those people die who have like severe type of traumatic brain injury or moderate type mild type you know the mortality is less um, so uh like uh, uh now few things which i will tell you for example you know uh, males are more commonly uh, susceptible or you can say um what you can say more more commonly get a tbi or traumatic brain injury than females right so this thing And one of the thing like uh, traumatic brain injury, you know, two age groups which are very common in getting traumatic brain injury. Um, you can say um, 15 to 25 years of age. Uh, like this is vulnerable age, of course, like because, you know, um, this is the time when um, like uh, the teenagers or like young people, they are, they have a lot of risk taking behaviors and like they do rash driving they are involved in sports they are involved in fights and things like this and then from 65 to 75 years of age um, so um, now these are old people right so basically um, this age group have uh, more falls um, 
again there is uh, multiple reasons behind that fall of course uh, um for example yes you know all the old people they have joint problems they have eyesight problems they have balancing problems they have um, arrhythmias they are on multiple drugs so uh, they are they can get hypotension so they have more falls simply okay nowadays motor vehicle accidents are the most common one Okay, most common cause of TBI, traumatic brain injury, right? Uh, because nowadays, of course, um, um, like, of course, uh, this is one of the uh, most preferred way of traveling, like uh, all the vehicles, like personal vehicle or like you're using public transport, whatever. So uh, simply like road traffic accidents or MVAs are very common. And, uh, um, and of course now, there are multiple factors like this is again a topic itself like when you will study traumatology or maybe you have done that already so you would know that uh, it depends like uh, what was the type of vehicle like uh, uh, motorbike or car uh, either the, pa the patient was or the person was using any seat belts or either there was any ejection from the car and things like this okay so all these things so uh, and now of course uh, uh, this is very common cause of TBI 50% of the cases are basically uh, motor vehicle accidents and uh, uh, the most common cause of death in MVS is like someone someone get ejected from the car and the second common one is violence okay um, violence is the second most common violence okay is the second uh, most common one mo most common cause right of tbi in young people of course and uh, there is a clear uh, association of alcohol with traumatic brain injury because many people who basically abuse alcohol um they they are more involved in risk taking in fights and things like this right so all these things are important so um, <clears throat> this is what you can say a very brief introduction about uh, this TBI. Uh, now, uh, what we are going to do is uh, uh, just to tell you what are the uh, types of TBI, okay, um, types of um, traumatic brain injury, okay. So, now, okay, so depending on what was the mode of the injury it could be a direct blow okay direct blow to the head uh, for example someone who who fall from some height like from second story third story fourth story uh, like this and not just in fights of course like many workers they get fall uh, one of the way is acceleration uh, acceleration uh, deceleration deceleration injuries right injuries okay as like for example what happened in the road traffic accidents or um, car crashes okay uh, so now um, the thing is uh, in this one acceleration deceleration injuries of course there is no direct blow to the head but what happens is that uh, uh, that acceleration and de sudden deceleration Due to that, there are there are forces uh, which are transmitted to the brain, which results in the primary injury. Okay, um, and uh, uh, of course, like and for, when someone have like direct blow on the head, so uh, of course, like it's, it's a direct force which is hitting the head. So um, we can see that you know there is a lesion in the brain by CT scan and things like this. So um, the most uh, you can say uh, areas which get um, injured of the brain are basically um, the frontal lobes and uh, uh, what you can say the orbits the temporal lobes okay like the temporal poles you can say uh, these are the most commonly which are uh, which get injured uh, whenever there is any traumatic brain injury uh, sometimes what happens is basically there is a rupture rupture of the blood vessels which uh, 
of course like inside the brain which can result into um uh, what you can say okay so simply there could be lesion due to um direct forces okay um and the uh, second thing which is there is like uh, um there is a rupture of the um, blood vessels okay so whenever the blood vessels are ruptured so now we know uh, because we have done that thing in surgery in internal medicine it can lead to hematomas it can lead to extra dural hematomas it can lead to um, uh, skull fractures or it can lead to subdural extra dural subdural uh, or intracranial all the hematomas can be there right um, due to that with skull fracture fractures okay uh, now um, one very important thing which we call it uh, which we call as DAI so what is DAI it is diffuse axonal injury okay what happens in this one uh, like if you know what is axon and if you know what is white matter and what is gray matter in the in the brain so whenever there is any rotational force okay um, this that rotational force can basically damage or can cause some injury in the white matter which can lead to petechial bleeding. You know, petechias are small spots of bleedings. So basically, whenever there is, uh, due to this rotational forces, there is damage to the white matter, um, which can lead to petechial hemorrhages or petechial ham bleeding in the brain. Uh, it can cause basically uh, what we say as axonal, um, axonal disruption. Okay, and as we know, like what are axons? Axons are the connections. Okay, so what we whenever there is axonal disruption, we call it as diffuse axonal injury. Okay, so uh, this this thing. Okay, not just this thing. Whenever there is any damage to the brain, no matter it's by the direct flow blow, it's by the acceleration deceleration injuries. It is a lesion. It's a rupture of the blood vessel. It's diffuse axonal injury. It can lead to um, a lot of changes or you can say inflammatory changes okay um, in the brain okay uh, okay what are those inflammatory changes in the brain uh, for example uh, um, there is uh, um, uh, what you can say some destructive changes goes on uh, like uh, starts on for example um, ionized calcium started coming at the area of injury and this calcium basically activates the um, enzymes which uh, results in damaging the structural proteins okay uh, and like it activates phospholipases and that break down cell membrane uh, which basically leads to um, oxygen free radicals and superoxide radicals okay and uh, due to that thing uh, what happens is uh, all these things basically cause what uh, it can cause ischemia okay and spasm and edema okay so you can say like all these are the primary things which are which are the thing and this thing which is a secondary that like which causes secondary damage to the brain is basically primary to these things okay like these things can activate the inflammatory changes in the brain which can lead to ischemia, which can lead to spasm, and which can lead to edema, okay? So all these things basically occur in TBI. So now, uh, as I told you, like, you know, in, in young people, the, uh, what you can say, the mechanism of injury is different. In the adults, the mechanism of the injury, injury is diff different. So I remember about the primary damage, we call it as primary injury or primary damage, okay? And remember about the secondary changes or the secondary injuries okay these are the secondary one so it which can lead to edema spasm or ischemia so uh, of course like I am telling you in a very short way but uh, yeah, of course like these changes can be appreciated on CT scan okay all these things like the, the, whenever there is um, anything any inflammatory process going on in the brain any edema all the things can be appreciated on the CT scan okay then of course we uh, like this one can okay can also be classified as you can say focal injury okay these are focal injuries and this is these are generalized injuries right so 
फॉर एग्जाम्पल फोकल इंजरीज लाइक फोकल स्केमिया हेमरेज द फोकल इंजरी नो मैटर मैटर इट्स एपीड्यूरल हेमाटोमा इट्स सब ड्यूरल हेमाटोमा इट्स अ हेमरेज वॉट एवर सो वी कॉल इट एज फोकल इंजरीज डिफ्यूज इंजरीज और जर्नलाइज इंजरीज लाइक वेन लाइक मच ऑफ द ब्रेन थिंग्स आर इन्वॉल्व सो ओके डी ए आई और डिफ्यूज एक्सोनल इंजरी कुड बी आ डिफ्यूज टाइप ऑफ इंजरी एज वेल राइट सो सिंपली ऑल दिस थिंग्स आर कैन हैपन ओके नाउ one of the thing which is very important about this one is um, what is the outcome or what is the um, prognosis okay a uh, prognosis of uh, uh, tbi or traumatic brain injury okay <laughs> now uh, basically there is a lot of factors which basically define um, what will be the outcome of this injury or what will be the mortality after the injury for example after the brain injury okay what happens is uh, they check the blood glucose levels they check the intracranial pressure they keep on checking the pupils right but all these things basically don't tell us about what will be the functional outcome okay one of the thing which is very very important very famous and i always ask the patients like all the sorry the, the students to learn about this thing which is gcs that is glasgow coma scale right so you must master glasgow coma scale so one of the thing by which they uh, keep on checking how the patient is uh, behaving is basically by glasgow coma scale okay because remember whenever there is brain injury it disturbs the consciousness and consciousness you know which is the function of the ascending reticular activating system uh, you know uh, Uh, like whenever there is injury it could lead to coma it could lead to vegetative state it can lead to minimally conscious state okay or what we can call it as you know confusion stupor lethargy uh, lethargy stupor and then coma okay so uh, uh, like coma as we know what is coma coma is like when you cannot wake uh, like uh, make anyone awake okay uh, so when you cannot make anyone awake or when the when the patient lack wakefulness it means what that their sleep waking cycles are not present okay so you can simply the patient eyes remain closed there is no spontaneous movements and uh, the person cannot talk and uh, all the things okay and then there is at one term which i use which is called as vegetative state okay when someone sleep wake cycle is present on eeg which is electroencephalogram we call it as vegetative state remember in coma on eeg sleep wake cycles are not there whereas in vegetative state on eeg sleep wake cycles are over there okay but there is sleep awake cycles but still the patient don't have any awareness of self or the surroundings okay uh, so this thing is important so in this one in vegetative state the patient can open the eyes okay but again like uh, there is no they don't have they are, they are not aware about self and the surrounding so uh, simply then there is a lot of explanation of that like what is vegetative state so one thing is called as persistent vegetative state when someone have more than one month and something is called as permanent vegetative state when this condition is present for more than 3 months okay after a non traumatic brain injury and then there is one more thing which is called as minimally conscious state now uh, these are the persons who are aware or who show awareness of self and surrounding but they are not fully conscious like the normal people okay and uh, when you check their visual fixation it is there okay all the things like they respond to the things but they are not normal people right so the thing so uh, the thing now gcs is very important glasgow coma scale is very important a uh, glasgow coma scale is used in all the emergencies okay uh, so one uh, the uh, like this is very important to learn okay but so simply someone who have low gcs worse outcome someone who have uh, more gcs a good outcome okay um so this thing is important 
Okay, one very important clinical predictor is uh, duration of coma. Okay, and um, one again very important thing is post traumatic amnesia. Okay, so basically, what happened is after the injury, the patients they forget and it's like um, they forget the events basically what happened before it. Uh, uh, before the event or before that accident right and if the patient have more like for example if the patient have uh, um, accident at five o'clock in the evening okay and he forget everything what happened right before accident uh, but he remember like what happened one hour before accident his prognosis is better than someone who forget even what he did in the morning okay that morning because he have more amnesia okay so simply whenever there is longer post traumatic amnesia it means worse outcome when the post traumatic amnesia is less uh, in duration it means good prognosis right so this is one of the thing uh, which is very very important in telling about the prognosis of this condition so uh, so all these things are important, right? So now uh, one of the thing which is very important in prevention or uh, okay, some of the factors which are universal like age, we know to old people they go they they show bad recovery, but the young people they they show good recovery. Okay, uh, so uh, of course like age plays role, and then there are many other roles like presence of other comorbidities and things like this, uh, but. Uh, of course, like uh, <clears throat> these are universal things which are um, what you can say, uh, which which are not just true for this trauma, but like true for any other condition, right? And um, then one of the thing which we do is like imaging. So CT scan is a very useful um, thing to check like how much is the injury, right? And of course, like as we know that someone who have more um, pronounced or more prominent injury they have the bad outcome uh, compared to someone who have like localized injury, right? And of course, like uh, one very, very important thing is like um, area uh, involved, okay, uh, in injury. Of course, like if it's a brain stem, maybe the damage will be much more. Uh, maybe if it's a, um, or you can say like a, a small lesion in the brain stem can cause major consequences as compared to a little large um, <clears throat> A lesion in the cerebral cortex okay so this thing so this is going to define what you can say the outcome so now uh, simply management okay how we manage these patients so management is always like remember first of all we have to stabilize the person so airway breathing circulation and then we what you what we do like uh, <clears throat> once the patient is stabilized uh, because of course like the first thing is to um, treat the patient right uh, sorry save the patient from dying so of course like you will do all the emergency procedures you will provide them with IV fluids you will do ABC um, so simply uh, all the things which we do in other type of emergency to um, save the patient like or to avoid all those things which basically can kill the patient um, of course like those things which can be done okay uh, and of course, like then we can go for examination, we can do GCS, we can do CT scan, we can check the age, we can check the pupillary light reflex, we can check, for example, the calorie testing, um, neurological examination, and we can also check like either it's post-traumatic amnesia length is more or less, right? Um, so of course, like based on these things, you can decide like either um, the patient to have... Uh, um, like what is the conscious level of patient either it's a, he's in vegetative state either in coma either like minimally conscious state so things like this right <clears throat> okay uh, one of the thing which we can do again in that case is FIM score which I already talked about what is FIM score it is functional independence measure and uh, it have 18 items and seven levels to assess the physical and cognitive function okay and uh, of course like what is what are these 18 items like 
um, you can say like, you know, there are motor items like uh, eating, grooming, bathing, uh, bladder control, bowel control, uh, how much the person is mobile, there is cognitive things like expressions, comprehension, reading, writing, and all those things, you know, they are there. So, uh, one more thing which can which is used in this one is called as JFK coma recovery scale. Okay, so that is again like I, I don't think so like you have to go in um, more detail of that. So simply we will do ABCs. Um, we will go for all the um, baseline investigations. Okay, doing blood, doing image imagings, which are which are done all the patient in all the patient of course. You will get a CT scan, you will get the ABGs, you will get the alcohol profile, you will get the metabolic profile and all those things, right? CT scan or brain MRI, whatever is done, okay? Uh, then we keep on checking the GCS scores, okay, in the patient. Um, now we observe the respiratory pattern of the patient, okay, either it's normal or not. We evaluate the ICP or intracranial pressure, okay? Um, or we can provide some painkiller or sedation to the patient by using benzodiazepines, barbiturates, propofol, things like this. So all the things are done. Okay. So of course, like if like well, I think this thing you should know that if anyone have, for example, raised intracranial pressure, so what can be done for those patients and things like this. Okay. And depending on, for example, if there is a hematoma. Of course, like uh, then the surgical, the management is surgical uh, to evacuate that. Okay, surgical craniotomy is done, or all the procedures can be done. Uh, many other things which arise, like seizure controls, can be done. Okay, so we give them prophylactic drugs to avoid seizures in that patient. Okay, because post traumatic seizures are a common thing. Uh, after uh, traumas, patients can go into um, seizures. Okay. Uh, all those things so of course like de depending on what is the type of trauma how much damage the patient have we are going to provide uh, assistance according to that okay so <clears throat> anyhow like all those things of course we we do in the patients whenever there is any patient who have uh, who come with the post-traumatic brain injury okay uh, then of course we go for like detailed survey we check like either the patient is uh, normal or not uh, one of the thing like in traumatic patients you know they are quite agitated okay they are in delirium and uh, um, like they are very what you can say those they show much aggression um, they show emotional liability and things like this so it, it can usually last for one to ten days okay sometime even more um, and uh, again there are scales to check for this thing uh, but what can be done in these patients is, uh, uh, okay, uh, we can put them on the floor, okay, we can limit the unnecessary sounds, we can limit the visitors, we can limit uh, the staff uh, to these patients, of course, uh, to not annoy them more, okay, so all the things, measures can be done, uh, but if like someone is too much agitated and he is not controlled by any way, um, then of course they they can use certain drugs like uh, um, domperidol or haloperidol and drugs like this. Okay, haloperidol can be given and chlorpyrazine can chlor chlorpromazine can be given as well. Um, sometimes atypical antipsychotic drugs can also be used like clozapine and olanzapine and risperidone and drugs like this. Uh, benzodiazepines can also be given uh, in that case. Okay. So see, seizure control, um, agitation management should be done. Okay, uh, agitation management should be done. Um, we can put them on antidepressants. Okay, as well, uh, of course, like to like uh, make them calm, um, things like this. Okay, um, and then of course, like all the secondary problems, we have to deal with them. So anyhow, like all these things. Uh, um, are what you can say uh, can happen in like traumatic brain injury um, and rest are all the later consequences of that okay so uh, simply uh, we uh, differentiate TBI or traumatic brain injury 
uh, into mild, moderate, and severe. Okay, and uh, like anyone who have particular TBI, they present with headache, dizziness, hearing loss, blurred vision, sleep disturbances, fatigue, depression, anxiety, and things like this. Okay, and again, like, like there are grades to grade like uh, uh, this traumatic brain injury. Okay, so uh, this is how they are going to manage. Okay. And now, of course, like uh, the physical consequences and why we are studying this, in, this thing in rehabilitation or you can say the consequences, right? Consequences. Okay. Now, uh, I will name a lot over here, but that doesn't mean like every patient will have a lot, but maybe someone have one, someone have many, right? So, um, it can lead to hypertension. Of course, we have to manage that. Um, it can lead to... Uh, um, what you can say uh, visual field problems okay um, or loss you can say it can lead to a spasticity uh, we have discussed this thing uh, it can lead to tremors okay um, it can lead to bowel and bladder problems okay um, it can lead to uh, vertigos okay um, it can lead to syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion and it can lead to for example thromboembolic diseases okay so of course like all the things are done and uh, rest of course uh, what you have done in um, what you can say um, in uh, stroke all this thing all those things can be applied over here as well okay after that one of the thing is spinal cord injuries okay uh, which are also written as scis okay scis okay sci or spinal cord injury okay um, now this one is uh, again um, uh, spinal cord injury of course um, uh, you can say like the mechanism of getting the spinal cord injuries is a little different than what we can get as like brain injury because of course like uh, um, here the, the head should be on the back okay so um, now this is also very common and again nowadays uh, motor vehicle accidents um, road traffic accidents you know uh, they are very common and then there is falls then there is violence okay um, sports okay um, and of, of course falls can be in young in a, a, a elderly right so uh, <clears throat> again like these are the ways uh, uh, which by which we can get a, a spinal cord injury so um, now um, the important thing about this one and why I'm teaching you this thing because the consequences will be the same as we know all the um, neurons which are coming from the brain they are passing like to the rest of the body to the rest of the body through the spinal cord right okay so what happens is um, spinal cord injury uh, uh, like uh, it can lead to uh, neurological type of injury right of course when the um, like the spinal cord is damaged of course like there will be some neurological consequences of that okay what are the causes of death in um, SCI okay what happens is that whenever someone have SCI or uh, um, uh, spinal cord injury it can lead to what it can lead to for example paraplegia paraplegia like when both of the lower legs they are not working or for example it can lead to quadriplegia uh, like uh, when all the limbs are not working or which you can also say it as tetraplegia okay um, and now one of the thing like uh, how we know that this is spinal cord injury because we can check the sensory level and depending on what level of the spinal cord is inv involved we can we can uh, on neurological examination we can see like what is the sensory level in that patient right and all the uh, spinal cord injuries can lead to spinal cord damage or myelopathy okay 
or like later on it can lead to spinal stenosis degenerative spinal stenosis or spinal instability or disc herniations okay um, whenever there is like the lower segment of the spinal cord is damaged we call it as quadric vena syndrome or conus medullar medullaris syndrome um, that thing we have done in surgery by the way okay uh, so what are the causes of death in uh, consequences and cause these are the consequences of course not causes of death but whenever um, um, whenever the spinal cord injury is very high for example in the cervical area it can lead to um, respiratory um, failure okay because you know the respiratory muscles you know the nerves are coming from there so uh, this one or respiratory failure can lead to pneumonia by which the patient can die um, okay the patient may have septicemia okay um, the patient may have uh, um, geni genito urinary uh, diseases okay like renal failure things like this okay um, so of course like these all can lead to the death of the patient right uh, okay now uh, to understand spinal cord you must know what are the ascending tracks what are the, are the, what are the descending tracks and uh, based on that of course like if the interior of the spinal cord is injured or the posterior side of the spinal cord is injured the consequences are different like for example in the posterior side of the uh, spinal cord uh, there are fast tracks are running fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus which are carrying the fast fibers or the sense of vibration proprioception and all this stuff right whereas the anterior lateral central you know all these cord syndromes in neurology you have done that okay so when there is spinal cord injury basically uh, or vertebral co column injury you can say uh, it can lead to um, okay it can lead to um, types of injury types of damage or injury um, you can say it can lead to flexion injuries okay uh, uh, it can lead to compression fractures of the vertebra okay um, it can you lead to uh, what you can say facet um, facet joints um, dislocations okay um, it can lead to uh, what you can say extension injuries okay um, it can lead to well, like well, okay so of course like due to this of course the spinal cord can, cord can get damaged so uh, anyone who has spinal cord injury of course like we go for investigations they go for um, ct scanning they go for mris okay um, they catch like either it's a, a fracture of a vertebral column and what kind of spinal cord is involved and all those things right so based on that um, like they decide what to do so as i told you like tetraplegia or quadriplegia or paraplegia can occur and uh, any of these things and you, you we do neurological examination to catch uh, what kind of things can be uh, can be uh, is there okay so uh, now um, the important thing uh, about spinal cord injury whenever anyone have a spinal cord injury what are the stages of uh, SCI so what happens like the first stage is basically spinal shock okay uh, spinal shock is the first stage uh, what happens like once uh, the spinal cord get injury there is loss of all the spinal reflexes so basically there is loss of the motor function the loss of the sensations the loss of the bladder control the loss of the bowel controls the muscles become flaccid there is airflexia or hyperreflexia and uh, there is what you can say there is loss of sweating there is loss of visomotor tone why because you know even the autonomic fibers are carried in the spinal cord so this is the first stage okay and uh, the second stage is basically uh, stage of increased um, reflex activity okay um, in the brain i was talking about the same thing you know whenever there is someone so once they're like the spinal shock is resolved you know uh, what happens like the reflex activities it started coming back and right now at this stage they are more hyper okay so there is hyper reflexia and it can lead to rigidity okay and uh, even like the bowel and the bladder 
reflex comes back or you can say the person gets back the control of the bowel but like there could be detrusor instability so uh, this thing these are the stages and that conus medullaris syndrome or cauda equina syndrome that completely depends where is the injury okay because when the injury is like at l1 l2 level it can lead to conus medullaris syndrome whenever the injury is below l2 we call it as cauda equina syndrome right so um now um depending on whatever it is uh, there is a very easy way um to differentiate between these two okay um i remember like there is saddle type of sensation loss okay um and uh, there is uh, bowel bladder and sexual functions uh, sexual dysfunction in the conus medullaris syndrome whereas whereas in the quadac with a syndrome the bowel and bladder they are spared okay so this is the main difference okay so in these two uh, okay so now um, depending on what is the level of the injury for example um, again now um, if you know um, uh, at which level you know different uh, nerves they come out from the spinal cord or the vertebral column and they they um, innervate the body so as we know that you know c1 to c4 um like these nerve roots are those which supply um our hands okay uh, so okay anyone who have uh, uh, what you can say like who c1 c4 is intact basically they can feed themselves okay feeding can they can feed themselves but other than that they cannot uh, what you can say uh, what you can say they, they cannot do anything okay so uh uh sorry uh, c1 to c4 they cannot do anything they are all dependent okay they are all dependent they are dependent on feeding grooming everything okay now remember anyone who have c5 is intact basically they can feed themselves okay they can uh, they can feed themselves okay but again um, other than that they are dependent on anything on on anything uh, they they wanted to do okay so uh, remember like anyone who have injury at c8 to t1 okay uh, these are the people who basically are independent independent uh, you can say um in feeding grooming dressing bathing and transfers like they can use their hands because if you know the innervation of the hand Uh, you know like the muscles of small uh, of the hand are supplied by which nerve root so you can understand what's going on right so uh, all the things of course like uh, they cannot move their legs but they can move their hand so they can do all the things right and uh, like they can even drive if by the modifications like when they they bring the accelerator to the hands okay so this is how they how they do so of course like anyone who have this uh, spinal cord injury Uh, depending on that whatever is there they have uh, bladder dysfunction they have um, like their their legs are not working or their hands are not working whatever of course um, rehabilitation plays a lot of role and all these things all all the things which we had discussed before they will be applied in the same way uh, on this one as well on these patients as well okay uh, to make them mobile as much as we can okay or to give them independent life as much as we can okay of course like they do have a lot of complications they do have a lot of complications but of course like that is beyond uh, like if we will start discussing the complications of course it is going to take a lot a lot of time for that so uh, simply anyone who has spinal cord injury uh, what they do of uh, initially they stabilize them and later on they they book them for rehabilitation the rehabilitation people uh, they do assessment they see uh, like what kind of functional independent they are or what are the things they are dependent or others so of course as i told you before there is a team of physical therapists of occupational therapists nurses psychologists vocational counselors and all these things okay uh, they assess the patient and they see like uh, uh 
what is the uh, what is the damage they have how much the damage they have um uh, what are the things they can do okay what are the complications they may have uh, of course like uh, we we have a lot of aims to prevent pressure sores utis contractures respiratory infections and things like this so of course like these come these are the primary problem problems because these are either difficult to heal or can kill the patient okay uh, but and later on of course um, they, they decide like what kind of rehabilitation they can give to them so uh, <clears throat> uh, there is of course uh, some recovery for example someone uh, who have injury at level c5 like after some time or within six months they gain a lot of function of c6 as well right so or cervical six nerve root as well um, so a lot of things are there even like they have sexual dysfunction okay uh, because like the nerves are damaged and you know the, the nerves are needed to for all this all these things so they, they 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 treat them according to that they treat utis they treat pressure sores they they treat the gastrointestinal complications they uh, try to manage orthostatic hypotension which is a very common thing because they lose the parasympathetic nerve control uh, they protect the patient against uh, uh, dvt okay many of them they have neuropathic pain so they give medications for that okay uh, for this neuropathic pains and uh, then of course like uh, uh, shoulder pain can be there contractures can be there so of course like all the things uh, they are going to manage them so thank you so much guys for listening i hope you understand the introduction and uh, i will see you in the next lecture